Our next speaker is um, Paula Daha from the. Uh, she's a global advocacy advisor at the Centre for Reproductive uh, Rights. Paula. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Anuist and the SRI, for convening this meeting. Uh, such conversations are especially needed, uh, especially in the current political context. So, thank you, Megan, for presenting areas where we can, you know, still make progress. I will be. Um, supporting you on that by presenting on the specific case of access to SRHR in conflict situations. Um, but first, let me give you a bit of context, especially political context, uh, in which we, we find ourselves now. So on January 23rd, uh, President Trump issued a presidential memorandum reinstating and expanding the Mexico City policy, also known as the Global Gag Rule. The, the Global Gag Rule is a U.S. foreign policy that, when enacted, prohibits NGOs that are not based in the U.S. that receive certain categories of U.S. foreign assistance funds from advocating for abortion or providing abortion as a method of family planning. As of now, the U.S. government has issued guidance which would implement the GGR as it existed under George W. Bush. However, as it has been indicated, this application will be expanded, but it's not clear yet what this will look like and what impact it will have on, on the lives of women and girls. Current estimates suggest that the reimposition of the global gag rule will contribute to 6.5 million unintended pregnancies, 2.1 million unsafe abortions, more than 20,000 maternal deaths, it will halt or limit the introduction, the introduction of new, affecting contraceptive options, thus really limiting choices and options for women and girls. It will affect the provision of family planning services in over 600 Ministry of Health sites. And it will end funding for voluntary family planning consultations and services for young people, including girls living with HIV and AIDS. A 2011 Stanford University study published in the Bulletin of the World Health Organization examined the impact of a previous iteration of the global gag rule in 20 African countries. It found that the policy was strongly associated with increases in abortion rates in sub-Saharan African countries. Another 2011 study published by the International Food Policy Research Institute found that the policy reduced access to modern contraceptive, leading to an increase in unintended pregnancies, especially among rural women. We are therefore, so the center is working together with other US-based organizations focused on sexual reproductive health and rights um, to try and provide support to our partners around the world and work together to combat and mitigate these dire consequences on women's rights and global health. This particular policy will most severely um, affect women and girls who are affected by conflict situations and fragile settings. Because of crumbling health and, and justice infrastructure, these women and girls are disproportionately reliant on non-governmental organizations and foreign aid. They will have to face increased risks of sexual violence, including rape, sexual assault, forced pregnancy, forced abortion, and will urgently need sexual and reproductive health services, such as obstetric and antenatal care for pregnant women, access to contraceptive information and services, including emergency contraception, and access to safe abortion and post-abortion care, but will find themselves unable to or prevented from accessing these services. It has been proven that maternal mortality and morbidity rates are significantly higher in countries considered as fragile by the OECD. Young women and girls were but will be particularly hit. Um, they, they are at higher risk of violations, such as child, early, and forced marriage, due, among other factors, to a lack of economic resources. Um, so several studies around child early and forced marriage in conflict situations or post-conflict settings have already been conducted. And according to UN Women, for example, the right of child marriage among Syrian refugee girls in Jordan is now 51% compared to between 13 or and 17% in Syria before the war. Disintegrating health infrastructure in conflict settings can have critical impacts on reproductive health. Unsafe, restrictive, or rep repressive environments also impact on their access to SRH information and services. Prohibitive costs, lack of information in a language they understand, and fear of further violence or stigmatization for seeking care make it difficult for women and girls to access these services. All of these factors will be compounded by the impact of the global gag rule. 
Of course, women and girls who find themselves at the intersection of different forms of discrimination will be most hardly hit. Addressing the lack of sexual and reproductive health information in, uh, and services in these settings is central, not only to an effective humanitarian response, but also to fulfilling fundamental human rights obligations. The global study on the implementation of, you know, of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, which highlights the role of women in conflict prevention, resolution and peace building, reports that a large number of women and girls do not report sexual violence because there are no easily accessible services or ways to report safely, receive help and be tra treated with dignity. In addition to the lack of access to healthcare services, Survivors of sexual violence and those who are denied access to sexual reproductive health care are rarely able to seek justice and remedies for the violations they have had to endure. Disintegrating judicial systems in conflict areas, discrimination against refugee population in host countries, fear of reprisals against their families or against themselves, and the stigma associated with sexual violence all prevent women and girls from seeking justice and legal remedies for the human rights violation they have experienced. But we have a legal framework that we actually advocate for the provision of SRH and foreign services in complex situations. The treaty monitoring bodies have reiterated many times that states have the uh, obligation, both, in the, in, both for people in their jurisdiction and, and extraterritorially to persons within their effective control, to ensure access to safe, um, to safe and the full range of SRHR. State re re receiving refugees are also obligated to respect, protect, and fulfill the refugees' human rights. States' obligations to realize women and girls' sexual and reproductive health and rights, including in conflict situations, are enshrined in numerous human rights. The right to equality and non-discrimination, the, right to, the right to life, the right to health. As specifically on the right to health, uh, treaty monitoring bodies have recognized that states should guarantee all women available, accessible, acceptable, and good quality reproductive health information, services, goods, and facilities, free from discrimination, violence, and, co and coercion. Especially the CEDA Committee, in, it, in its general recommendation number 30, have recognized the breakdown um, in access to, to health services in conflict-affected areas, and have explicitly called on states to ensure access to sexual and reproductive health care in conflict settings, including maternal health services, contraception, emergency contraception, and safe abortion and post-abortion care, and HIV and AIDS prevention and treatment. This right is also enshrined in the right to be free from harmful traditional practices, the right to be free from sexual and gender-based violence, and the right to an effective remedy. Under each of these rights, treaty monitoring bodies have clarified states' obligations to ensure access for women and girls to the full range of sexual and reproductive health information and services. What is it that we can do here at the Human Rights Council? A human rights-based approach to sexual and reproductive rights in conflict settings should address and recognize the root causes of SRHR violations to better prevent and eradicate them and would put accountability and participation at the center of every intervention. The approach would take stock of the legal protection gaps and harmful policies in national contexts that would need to be changed. It would reaffirm states' obligations under human rights law and clarify the positive measures that, sh that states should take to ensure women's access to sexual and reproductive health services. A human rights-based approach to the provision of SRH and foreign services in these settings would ensure and prioritize the meaningful participation of women and girls in all stages of the humanitarian response and interventions that directly affect them, from the development to the implementation, monitoring and evaluation of service policies and programs. A human rights-based approach would also help guarantee a broader understanding of accountability by ensuring that we are not speaking about you know, accountability for perpetrators of sexual violence, but really to address all the fact that to ensure that there are functioning mechanisms to access justice and that these mechanisms are able to confer meaningful and effective remedies and reparations on the basis of non-discrimination. When we speak about reparation, we speak about compensation, restitution, rehabilitation, measures of non-repetition, and where needed, measures to promote physical and psychological re recovery. 
there should be an appropriate gender assessment to the harm that is suffered, meaning that reparations should address women's specific needs and the structural inequalities that enable the violations in the first place, with a view to ensuring that these violations do not continue. The CEDA committee has called for reparative measures to be transformative, meaning that they address the structural inequalities which led to the violations of women's rights, respond to women's specific needs, and prevent their reoccurrence. Inter inter international human rights bodies and political bodies, including the Human Rights Council, must address violations of sexual and reproductive rights in conflict settings by including them in their state reviews, for example, at the HLPF, by passing relevant resolutions calling on states to recognize the importance of a human rights-based response and strengthening the human rights underpinnings of the WPS framework, for example. The Council should also advocate for the integration of a human rights-based approach in the delivery of SRHR services. Mainstreaming the issue of women, of the particular situation of women and girls in conflict is something that the Council has already started to do. We have managed to get a specific mention uh, around this specific topic on the CEFM resolution that was discussed two years ago, on the maternal mortality resolution that has been negotiated last September. This is something that states should continue to do to ensure that the specific case of women and girls in conflict do not go unaddressed and are not confined to the humanitarian um, community but are, but are central and crucial to the human rights community and the human rights response. Thank you. So where do we look for good examples? Which member states are following as close as possible a human rights-based approach to the provision of sexual and reproductive health and rights? In terms of the delivery of SRH and foreign services, you mean? Um, I mean, it's it, with, the, with the current Syrian crisis, for example, it's, it has been difficult to identify that, you know, states, we have to take into account that some states are overwhelmed in, uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 sorry, in uh, accepting refugees. Um, I think that in Europe or even in the Middle East, when we are faced with the women who are affected by conflict, there should be a comprehensive approach to, to um, to providing SRH and foreign services. I don't have in mind specific uh, examples, but I do know that in Greece, for example, we have had uh, testimonies from women who were on the move who wanted to have access to antenatal care, who had to have you know, uh, access to emergency contraceptive, etc., and who were not able to do it. Some um, humanitarian organizations had set up tents along the way, you know, during, from Greece to Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. uh, when they wanted to access Western Europe, uh, Western Europe, European countries, and they, they were doing whatever they could, but it was very difficult because of all the constraints. You know, you have to respect the national laws, which are not always the most favorable to access to SRH information services, especially when it comes to emergency contraception and safe abortion care. So states have had to deal with all of these constraints. And, but I think that the, the first and most important thing is to really listen to the women and girls. We have had some testimonies coming from uh, organizations in Lebanon who work closely with UNFPA, who have told us basically once they reach Lebanon, the first thing that Syrian refugee women and girls ask for is access to contraceptive. And the full range of contraceptive might not be able, might not be available to them, so it's it's uh, uh, layers upon layers of discrimination and barriers that they face in accessing the full range of of, of SRH information and services. We have had some good. Uh, good experiences here at the Council in including these specific issues in resolutions um, with the core groups that are, that are working on the CFM or maternal mortality resolutions, and we hope to continue this positive example um, with other resolutions and other core groups. Okay, thank you.